When the Buddha was asked to define what a being is, he didn't say there is no such thing. He answered in a straightforward way. Wherever there is attachment, there's going to be a being. Attachment to what? The five aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, fabrications, consciousness. Then he went on to illustrate his point with an analogy. He says, it's like little kids playing with mud houses. You might think of playing with sand castles. As long as little kids were fascinated with the little mud houses, they were very protective of them. If anyone tried to come along and kick their mud houses or step on them, they would defend them. But then when they themselves lost interest in the mud houses, when they lost their desire and fascination with the mud houses, then they themselves would kick them and step on them and make them unfit to play. In the same way, the Buddha said, try to lose your desire for the aggregates, demolish them, make them unfit to play, and you'll be freed from being a being. We have to explain that a little bit, though. You don't destroy the aggregates. You try to destroy your desire for them. That's a very different thing. It's the desire that holds them all together. That's what you've got to focus on. But first you've got to see yourself, the being that you've created out of these aggregates, in those terms. You have to get familiar with what an aggregate is. In other words, you've got to play with your aggregates. That's what we're doing as we practice. When you're meditating, you've got five aggregates right here. There's the form of the body that you're sitting in right now. The breath is part of that form. There's a feeling of pleasure you're trying to create by staying focused on the breath. There's your perception of the breath, the image you have of it. That allows the breath to flow through the body and can direct the flow in the different ways you want it to. There are your thought fabrications, starting out with directed thought and evaluation. And then there's your consciousness of all these things. You try to put these things together in as best a way as you, as you can. Just like little kids making their mud houses, you want to make a really nice little mud house here. And in doing so, you learn about the aggregates. Just in getting the mind to right concentration, you begin to see oh, there are these activities that you do. And then as you go into deeper stages of concentration, you begin to realize there are more refined versions of them. You can let go of the directed thought and evaluation, and the mind feels less burdened. You can let go of the feeling of pleasure, and you're left with just a feeling of equanimity, which is even lighter. You get the breath energy to fill the body to the extent where you don't have to breathe in and breathe out. Your sense of the boundary of the body begins to disappear. The perception that holds the notion of body in mind. You can put that down, and you can replace it with more refined perceptions, perceptions of space, perceptions of knowing, nothingness. And you begin to wonder, how far can you take this process of refinement? Because you see that this is a really good way of dealing with these aggregates. It's like little kids getting really good at making really nice mud houses. You develop a skill. And that's the best way to know anything, is to get skillful with it. 
otherwise you can hear about the aggregates, and it seems like, like an artificial way of dividing up your experience. But when you're trying to get the mind concentrated, you see, this is how you put this state of becoming together, with just these activities. And you find that you finally reach a limit as to how far you can go and as you hold on to these activities. And then you turn around and you look at the rest of your life, and you realize that your sense of who you are. As the Buddha said, when you, even people who have, have the ability to reflect back on past lifetimes, what are they reflecting back on? The form, feeling, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness they had at those times. You don't need to reflect on past lifetimes, just think back on your life so far, this lifetime, when you remember your childhood. It'd be feelings, perceptions, thought constructs. That's all there was. That's how you created your sense of self, of who you were, and what you were going to use in order to get what you wanted. This is where the desire for the aggregates comes in. Either you desire the aggregates directly, or you desire them for what they can do for you. But here you begin to see the limitations. This is the best thing you can do with aggregates, create a state of concentration. And yet it has its limitations, the big one being that you have to keep maintaining it. It's always ready to fall apart. You get skill in the concentration so that you don't let it fall apart, but there's an effort that has to go into that. Concentration is always something you do. And you look back and you begin to realize that your idea of what you were was something you did as well. You're constantly doing. And you look forward. As the Buddha said, you get so that you can't stay in this body anymore. But as long as they're still clinging and craving, there's still going to be that seamstress that stitches all this together. That's what the Buddha calls craving, a seamstress. Stitches all the aggregates together, makes them into a being. And you're going to find more aggregates. Repeat the process. And as you reflect on this, there, there comes a point where it begins to seem futile. Because no matter how good it gets, you never really arrive with the aggregates. Because they're all fabricated. And the nature of fabrication is it's done for the sake of something. It's moving towards something. And when it arrives, it keeps on moving towards something else, and moves towards something else. It never really arrives. The only thing that arrives is the path, which you're making out of those aggregates. It's the best thing you can do with them. Use the aggregates of concentration to develop a sense of dispassion for other kinds of aggregates. But then you're still here with the concentration, you're still here with the discernment. And this is where the discernment gets really sharp when it begins to see that even the concentration, even the discernment are fabricated. And if you're going to find real happiness, you have to let them go. And it's the insight that allows you to let go. It's going to be a very special insight. When the Buddha talks about it, he talks about it in paradoxical terms. You intend the path, putting it all together. But there comes a point where you have to stop intending. And you can't tell yourself, don't intend, because that will become a new intention. But there is a middle way between intending and not intend, and telling yourself not to intend. And that's the escape. And what allows for the escape is dispassion. That's the point where 
you lose interest in this mud house. and you make it unfit to play. In other words, you take the mind to a point where it's not going to build mud houses anymore. You've seen the house builder, as the Buddha said, after his awakening. And you've demolished the last house, and the house builder's not going to build it anymore. That's when you've really arrived. But even with the first taste of awakening, stream entry, you see that there is such a thing as a dimension where there is no fabrication, and it's totally devoid of any kind of stress. You don't realize how much stress goes into fabrication until you step out of it. But the only way you're going to get there is to get to know these aggregates really well. You can read about them and say, gee, what the Buddha says ain't makes a lot of sense. But that's not a going to cut through your fascination with them. You have to work with them. Make them into a state of concentration. Use this body to practice virtue, generosity, meditation. Use the mind to get into concentration. develop discernment, and allow these things to deliver you to something that's beyond them. That's when you really, really lose your passion for these things, and all the stitching of the seamstress falls apart. And what's left after that it depends on your karma. But your relationship to the six senses is altered. For an arahant, there's no more feeding on things outside, because there's no hunger. There's no more being that needs to be fed. This is why they, when people ask the Buddha, there's an arahant after death exist or not exist, or both or neither, the Buddha wouldn't answer, because it was the passion for the aggregates that defined the arahant. When there's no passion, the arahant is undefined, and when something is undefined, you can't say anything about it. But there is nirvana, and this is the path that takes you there. That's why the Buddha called it the path that takes you someplace really good. You don't stay on the path. You don't take the path as your goal. If you stayed on the path, you wouldn't have called it a path. It would have been a noble eightfold spot. But it's a noble eightfold path that takes you someplace beyond it. And as you practice the path, you learn about these aggregates by playing with them making the best things possible with them, and then finally deliver you to where you want to go. And everyone who's been there said that's the end of, the, end of all problems. So you think of that image of the children. They were creating problems by playing around. But if you learn how to play wisely, You can put those problems down. 